day of symbolism, of history, and of the future, we welcome Germany's Bundeskanzler Olaf Scholz. Herr Bundeskanzler, Herr Bundeskanzler, herzlich willkommen in Europa Parliament. Chancellor, welcome to the European Parliament. Not be safeguarded without the making of creative efforts proportionate to the dangers which threaten it. So begins the declaration presented by Robert Schuman on 9th May 1950. It rings true today. Every year on this day, we celebrate Europe, an unprecedented project of reconciliation fundamentally based on solidarity, a project that brings people together without trying to make us all the same, a project that lit a light that permeated through iron curtains and concrete walls. Europe Day reminds us of what is possible when we come together, of the responsibility that we need to have to keep moving forward. The Schuman Declaration, our European Union, took bravery. Change takes courage. Well, the European Union is not perfect. I know many share our frustrations with some of our processes, but the fundamental pillars of hope, of possibility, of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law make this political project unique. We cannot take what we stand for and what we have achieved and what we must achieve still for granted. We must keep evolving. European progress was made possible thanks to daring solutions. And more daring solutions will be needed moving forward. I know we can count on Germany for just that. Yours, dear Chancellor, is a member state which shows unwavering commitment to the betterment of Europe. So let me thank you for Germany's support for Ukraine, for Germany's contribution to the construction of new EU security architecture, for Germany pushing new technologies, for Germany defending human rights, such as the rights of women and men in Iran, and for so much more. Chancellor, you have said we have every reason to be more optimistic about our future. That is the spirit we must drive us forward. We must reform, anticipate change, not suffer it. We must find that courage that underpinned the Schuman Declaration again. We must help that light keep shining brighter. We know that we are so much stronger when we are together and we will look to Germany as to all the member states to help reform and prepare our European future. The European Union matters. It is worth it. Es lebe Europa. Herr Bundeskanzler, the floor is yours. Frau Präsidentin, sehr geehrte President, ladies and gentlemen, members, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today on Europe Day in this special place. Your invitation honours and touches me. I'm honoured because you are the freely elected members of the European Parliament and you represent 450 million Europeans, the citizens of Europe. And I'm touched because the 9th of May is the appropriate forward-looking response to the world war unleashed by Germany, the response to destructive nationalism and imperialistic megalomania. Today, 73 years ago, the French Foreign Minister Robert Schuman proposed creating an organised and living Europe. At the start, 
we had the pooling of coal and steel. So those goods that for decades had been used to manufacture weapons. Weapons which our grandfathers and great-grandfathers had used to shoot at each other. The dream of the fathers and mothers of Europe was to end this murderous cycle for once and for all. And this is a dream that has been fulfilled for us. War between our peoples has become unimaginable. And that's thanks to the European Union, and that's something that benefits us all. But looking in the direct neighbourhood of the European Union shows us a terrible reality, which is that this dream is not a reality in all the countries of Europe. With great sacrifice, people in Ukraine defend on a daily basis their freedom and democracy, their sovereignty and their independence against a brutal Russian army of invasion, and we support them in that. The, ground, the founding fathers and mothers assigned the growing Europe an important task which went far further than just internal peace. For them, Europe had a clear responsibility for global affairs. The well-being of Europe cannot be separated from the well-being of the rest of the world. To quote the Schumann Declaration, this production, coal and steel, will be offered to the world as a whole without distinction or exception, with the aim of contributing to raising living standards and promoting peaceful achievement, achievements. With increased resources, Europe will be able to pursue the achievement of one of its essential tasks, namely the development of the African continent. Back then, the development of the African continent stood in contrast to the mainly Europe-led colonial exploitation of our neighbouring continent. Even back then, overcoming the consequences of colonialism was an essential feature of Europe's partnership with the countries of Africa, Asia and Latin America. A partnership that left behind the Eurocentric vision of previous decades. And that not only calls for, but establishes equal terms between us as partners. And establishing these partnerships seems to me more important than ever today. 450, and perhaps following the next enlargement, perhaps 500 million citizens live in the EU. That's around 5% of the global population. New economic, demographic and political heavyweights are appearing in Asia, Africa and South America, a result of the distribution of labour between countries and continents, which have raised a billion people out of poverty. And they quite rightly won't be satisfied with a bi- or tripolar world order. And therefore, I firmly believe that the world of the 21st century will be multipolar. It has been for a long time already. But what does that mean for us in Europe? To quote the French author Paul Valéry, will Europe be what it actually is, a small promontory, a headland of the Asian continent? And we can't find the answer to that question by looking back. Those who are nostalgic for European great power status, fantasies which remain among some people, they're stuck in the past as are those who warn constantly of Europe's decline. They can't win the challenges of the future. They underestimate one thing, Europe's ability to change and to act, and that's something that we've shown again and again in the crisis of recent years and of the present. Let's just think about how we together, in a supportive manner, came through last winter. I think the three lessons to emerge from that are as follows. Firstly, Europe's future is in our hands. Secondly, the more united we stand, the easier it is to ensure a good future. And thirdly, not less, rather more openness and more cooperation are the order, are the watchwords of our time. We need to ensure Europe an appropriate place in the world of tomorrow, a place that is not greater or lesser than that of other countries and regions, but on an equal footing with others, side by side. 
And in order to do that, the European Union needs to change. We need a geopolitical EU, an enlarged and reformed EU, and last but not least, an EU that is open to the future. I see the European Parliament as a driving force for all of those, and also an ally. Let's look at the creation of a geopolitical Europe, for example. Here, 50 years ago, Willy Brandt talked about this as an ex existential need. He wrote, a united Europe isn't only a question of the quality of our existence, it's a question of survival between giants in a world divided between old and new nationalisms. The European Parliament has always acted in accordance with this maxim, and I'm very grateful to you for that. You act along those lines when you uphold the primacy of the law and when you recall that Europe can only be listened to when it speaks with one voice. Russia's brutal, brutal aggression, war of aggression against Ukraine has shown us all how essential this is. And as a logical consequence, the European Union has rarely been more united than in standing up to this violation of European and international, the international order. So let's base a geopolitical Europe on this experience. I made some proposals as to how that should happen at the Charles University in Prague last summer. We need closer links between our efforts at defence and the establishment of an integrated European defence economy. The European Peace Facility, joint procurement of ammunition for Ukraine, closer cooperation between our countries on air defence, our strategic compass, and close cooperation between NATO and the EU. All these are approaches that we want to deepen and speed up. We now have to look to the reconstruction of Ukraine as well. That will require political and financial capital over the long term. But there is a major opportunity there, not only for Ukraine, but for Europe as a whole, because a prosperous, democratic, European Ukraine is the clearest possible rejection there can be to Putin's imperial, revisionist, uh, revision, revisionist and illegal policy on our continent. We also need to compete with other great powers. The United States remains Europe's most important ally. When we invest more in our security and defence, civilian resilience, technological sovereignty, reliable supply chains, in our independence when it comes to critical raw materials, well, those investments make us better allies for our transatlantic friends. Our relationship with China can be described as competitor, systemic, uh, partners, competitor and systemic rival. And rivality and competitiveness on the side of China have certainly increased. The EU has seen this and is reacting. I agree with Ursula von der, von der Leyen when she says no decoupling but a smart de-risking is the way to go. The countries of the Global South are new partners and we need to take their concerns and interests seriously and that's why it's so important that Europe works supportively and decisively for food security and to fight poverty. We also need to keep the promises that we made at international climate and environment conferences. That also belongs to a geopolitical Europe. We need to rapidly conclude new free trade agreements with Mercosur, Mexico, India, Indonesia, Australia, Kenya, and also in the future with many other countries. Faire Abkommen, die die wirtschaftliche Entwicklung fair agreements that support our partners' economic developments rather than hindering it. They need to be fair. And that means, for example, that the initial processing of raw materials needs to take place in situ rather than in China or elsewhere. If we anchor these thoughts in our trade relations, then 
we can make a major contribution to diversifying our supply chains. Europe must turn to the rest of the world. If we continue to negotiate fruitlessly for years on new free trade agreements, then in the future will be others who dictate the rules with lower environmental and social standards. A key decision over the shape of a geopolitical Europe was taken last year and the European Parliament was a driving force there as well. We have decided to go for a larger Europe. We have said to the citizens of the West Balkan states, Ukraine, Moldova and potentially also Georgia, you belong to us. Wir möchten, dass we want you to become part of the European Union. And this isn't just about altruism. This is about our credibility and good economic sense. And it's also about securing peace in Europe, subsequent to the watershed moment that was Russia's attack on Ukraine. A geopolitical Europe must keep its promises to its neighbours. An honest enlargement policy sticks to its promises, first and foremost, those made to the states of the West Balkans, to whom we've been promising accession for 20 years. Obviously, the normalisation process between Serbia and Kosovo and reforms in accession countries must be continued. Obviously, more rapid progress towards accession must follow North Macedonia's courage as well. Solche Fortschritte müssen dann These steps forward need to be appreciated and honoured on our side, because otherwise the enlargement, uh, enlargement policy uses its ability to act as an incentive and the EU loses influence and attraction. Honesty means an enlarged EU needs to be a reformed EU. Obviously, enlargement shouldn't be the only reason for reforms, but it should be an arrival point. And I expressly welcome the fact that the European Parliament is working on proposals for institutional reforms, even on proposals that don't spare the Parliament itself. And I will continue to call on the Council to discuss these ideas. Now many things, or some things, are obvious. More council decisions through qualified majorities, for example, in foreign policy and on taxation. Dafür werde ich weiter Überzeugungs and I will continue to make efforts at persuasion. And I'm very grateful for the wide support I'm receiving from the Parliament. I would say to skeptics, it's not unanimity, it's not 100% agreement on all decisions that creates democratic legitimacy. Quite the opposite. It's efforts to get majorities, negotiations for alliances that may mark us out as Democrats. The search for compromises, which are also in the interests of minorities, that reflects our understanding of liberal democracy. I think we need to ensure that we stick to democratic principles and the rule of law within the EU as well. And I know that the vast majority of you are on my side here as well. So why don't we use the current discussion on reforming the EU to strengthen the Commission and ensure that it can introduce infringement proceedings when our basic values are violated, our basic values such as freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law and guarantees of human rights. Meine Damen und Herren, noch Ladies and gentlemen, there's something else which I've just mentioned which is important. As Europeans, we need to open up to the future without ifs or buts. That means dealing with problems that have beset us for years we need to ensure that other countries can't split us and play us off against one another. And here I'm thinking, for example, 
about the way we deal with migration. Now, obviously, we need a solution that's in line with the European claim to solidarity. But we can't wait until this solidarity appears to us like the Holy Ghost. As Robert Schuman said 73 years ago, Europe is made through concrete achievements, through de facto solidarity. And I would therefore urgently call on us to conclude on the joint European asylum system reform. We've taken steps forward in Council after long and difficult negotiations, and let's do that before the European elections. Your agreement on a negotiating position was an important part, on important parts of this reform last month, was an important step along this path. So we need to conclude this work. We agree on the goal that we need to better manage migration without betraying our values. But there is something that we could do better than we have done so far. In many parts of Europe, we urgently need workers also from third countries. Now, if we link opportunities for legal migration with the requirement for transit countries and countries of origin to take back those who have no right to remain, well, then all sides will benefit. Also, we need to ensure the effective protection of our external borders, as we agreed in the European Council meeting in February. That would increase the acceptance of smart, managed and controlled migration to our countries. And then we would take the bedrock away from those who do politics on the basis of fear and resentment. Opening up to the future means that we also need to deal with the most important tasks that we face. And here I'm talking about our countries, economies and societies moves into a climate neutral future. The first industrial revolution took place, started in Europe. And it should be our claim that the second industrial revolution also takes place here to the benefit of everyone. I don't need to explain to you the opportunity that we have here. And it's important for the citizens of our countries to also feel that as part of their daily lives. With cheaper electricity, for example, made from renewable energies, so that we've got charging stations for electric cars and lorries right across Europe, so that we have future-oriented jobs in the energy sector or in the chips industry, because the entire world will need the technology for climate neutrality. We need to shape this change in an ambitious manner and not leave anyone behind. That is the large project that we need to look to as Europeans now. To quote Oscar Wilde, the future belongs to those who recognise opportunities before they become obvious. Now this is not something for nostalgics. And it's certainly not something for revisionists who dream of international greatness or imperial power. The Ukrainians are paying with their lives for this delusion on the part of their powerful neighbour. 2,200 kilometres northeast from here, in Moscow, Putin is parading his soldiers, tanks and artillery. Let's not be intimidated. Let's stand firm in our support for Ukraine as long as is necessary. I don't think any of us wants to go back to a time when the law of the jungle reigned in Europe, when small countries had to bow to large countries, when freedom was a privilege of the few rather than a fundamental right for everyone. Our European Union, united in its diversity, is the best insurance that we have to ensure that this past does not return. And that's why the comment, the message of the 9th of May, is not what's coming from Moscow today. The message is ours, and it is that the past will not triumph over the future. The future, our future, 
is the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much, Chancellor Scholz. Thank you very much, Chancellor Scholz, for that inspiring speech. I give the floor now uh, to the representatives of the different particular groups, starting with the president of the EPP group, Manfred Weber. I would like to make an appeal for everybody to stick to time, please. Go ahead. Sehr geehrte Frau Präsidentin. Madam President, Commission Representative, Chancellor Schultz, welcome to the heart of European democracy. Yesterday, the 8th of May, we uh, remember the uh, liberation from Nazism. And 9th of May, we are happy about the courage of the fathers of European unity. Uh, just one day in the week, perhaps, uh, a chance of history but it's amazing that between there are only five years between these two um, landmarks in European uh, history. It um, uh, showed courage to go against uh, public opinion at the time. Uh, Conrad Adenauer held out his hand for West Germany. Um, Stalin uh, chose European unity. He chose. Uh, Germany chose NATO, European unity, against um, uh, public opinion and uh, other currents. Today, uh, we have the energy crisis and the RRF. All these things were managed, but uh, Adnar, Kohl, and Mitterrand, they were um, pol politicians who just didn't act in the everyday. They had uh, courage to act. They talked about the uh, removing uh, unity, uh, unanimous decisions in uh, foreign policy, uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, organized an extra uh, conference on the future of Europe. The re-election uh, of Macron uh, didn't lead to a convention. Chancellor, we need, we don't need uh, talk about uh, uh, fundamental rules. We need the courage to take Europe into the future. Europe needs leadership. And we in the EPP we call for a convention to revision the uh, treaties to make uh, Europe fit for the decades to come. Secondly, Europe is thankful for the clear pro-European position of Germany, all the uh, democratic parties in uh, Germany, but we need uh, uh, the decision on uh, ab abolition of uh, um, uh, combustion engines led to some controversy. controversy. We need uh, uh, big questions when it comes to China. The German finance, the finance minister couldn't travel to China. They want to uh, invest in the Hamburg port. The, the we have a, a big uh, single market effect when it comes to uh, dealing with the Ukraine war. Uh, uh, it seems that many people in Berlin don't believe uh, in the military uh, uh, victory of Ukraine. And now, after months of debate, the p tanks are being delivered. Many positions of your government come too late and uh, have too little ambition. Europe needs a, a clear, uh, clear signs from Berlin. And for the Christian Democrats, I would like to say that we need to uh, f fight uh, cl climate, uh, the climate crisis together. We have defined, decided many things, ETS, etc. It's not enough. Uh, the sale of F FISMA uh, is a warning sign. Our companies don't believe in the Green Deal, it seems. They don't believe in the business case behind it. Will we, uh, are we creating more jobs in China or in Europe? We must see that we get uh, competitiveness bias back on the agenda. Food production is another uh, uh, big topic. Uh, we have inflation in food prices. We must uh, export more to uh, North Africa. We're not doing that. And uh, our farmers are being, being made, um, to, uh, are being blamed. And we don't need that. 
uh, when you came, joined the SDP, uh, Willy Brandt made a promise, and I quote, more democracy, we need to dare more democracy. I'd like to ask you, what does this mean for Europe? What does it mean here for in this parliament? In 2023, uh, for me in the EPP, uh, uh, the election of a candidate means a, a program and ideas so that people can decide. It goes for the uh, election of a mayor or a chancellor or for the election of a president of the European Commission. Unfortunately, the proposals of this parliament for the Spitzen candidate process and for the transnational lists, which were decided here, were, um, were not accepted by M Macron or Merkel or Sanchez or by you. So in the spirit of Willy Gunt, Brandt, less uh, backroom uh, talks in the, uh, the Council and more debates in the European Parliament. We need to do all this today and not tomorrow. Now I give the floor to the President of the S&D Group, Irache Garcia Perez. Gracias, President. Thank you, President. Welcome, Chancellor, my dear friend, Olaf Scholz. It is a pleasure to welcome you to the European Parliament on the day on which we commemorate the birth of our shared project to safeguard peace and liberty on our continent. Chancellor, on the 23rd of May next, the German SPD party will celebrate its 160th anniversary, 160 years building a free, democratic, modern Europe, ever striving for greater equality between citizens. Your presence in this chamber comes at a time when Putin Putin's war against Ukraine has reached a critical juncture with the Ukrainian army's spring offensive pending. We want to see peace in Ukraine, but not if it leaves a people conquered. We would like to see a just peace rooted in respect for international law. And for as long as the war lasts, we must continue to support the Ukrainian people in all areas, political, humanitarian, military, economic, financial support, as well as in their fight against impunity. We are very clear on that in this House. We are also in a period of high inflation that is hurting people, particularly the most vulnerable. We must be resolute, respect the goals of the social pillar, transpose the minimum wage directive, adopt a directive on minimum living income and the right to housing, a basic right. Mr Schultz, we are aware that the war has had an impact on German industry and households. Thanks to your leadership, Germany has taken tough decisions, necessary decisions on matters key to the future of our EU. Military support for Ukraine, gas ceilings. And now we need to lead the way on reform of the electricity market to ensure reasonable prices. Ladies and gentlemen, if we want to move towards much desired strategic autonomy, move towards reindustrializing the EU, then we need, in addition to approving the CHIPS Act and reform of the electricity markets, we must accelerate work on the proposal dealing with critical raw materials. We need to address social, climate and environmental challenges. We need to ensure reindustrialization. And to this end, we need to strengthen economic governance. We need clearer, flexible, more flexible fiscal rules so that we can strike a balance between budget stability and economic growth. Today, on the 9th of May, we celebrate Europe Day. For the Social Democratic family, Europe represents a community of values. Values that are today called into question by the far right and those in the conservative right that have become the opposition now in Europe. We've seen that in Germany too. I believe that what is important here is to strengthen the alliances that led to the creation of Europe, those shared values. We cannot give way to those that look to destroy our European project. You will have much more in common with uh, Chancellor Schultz than Ms Meloni, for example. Gratis. Mr Schultz. We Social Democrats are not de facto Europeans. We are Europeans by conviction. In the darkest times in recent history, our commitment has never wavered.
I firmly believe that on the 9th of May there is no better gift than a commitment on the part of the German government to continue breaking deadlocks and striking agreements in times of crisis, making headway on integration, breaking taboos, working to advance and champion our system of values. In other words, champion democracy, freedom and respect for human rights. Thank you. Next is the president of the Renew Europe group, Stéphane Sejournet. Madame uh, la Présidente. President, Chancellor, colleagues, I'd also like to welcome you to the European Parliament, Chancellor, particularly given that Germany's European commitment has been a constant feature of recent decades. I should say, Chancellor, that your coalition has given a new momentum to this commitment during recent months. And Renew Europe is proud that some of our proposals, such as transnational lists, the end of unanimity in foreign policy, which is something that we need, given the situation with China, are official policies of the German government, and these are policies that came from the FDP. Now, this new determination to rethink Europe and look to the future is crucial, and your Prague speak, Ch Chancellor, was welcome. Now, we, members of the European Parliament, expect member state capitals to articulate this vision of a historical turning point because managing crises is not enough. We need to prevent the next set of crises. We need to look ahead and build. Look at energy, Chancellor, for example. We've made it through the winter. We've made efforts to diversify our supplies and accelerate on renewables. We've worked in that sense on the, in, the, in the European Parliament. But next winter is the real challenge. And... This will be a particular challenge given our increased need for electricity. We need to produce more electricity and it cannot be carbon based. So what are your proposals at the European level to ensure that our continent is at the vanguard of the energies of the future? Germany also has a responsibility for the stability of electricity networks in the context of European solidarity, given that it is the largest economy in the EU. On digitalisation, our continent managed to impose our ethical standards and our model, and I'm confident that we will be in the lead on defining new international standards on AI, as we did for the internet giants and e-commerce. But Europe shouldn't just be there to curb technological breakthroughs. It should be driving them, and we should be the place where investments in AI and quantum are made. Nevertheless, we know... There's a lot still to do when it comes to freeing up investments and training. The green transition and the digital transition are two pillars of European sovereignty. And they will be successful because of what Europe and its member states do, but also because we will provide a framework that is favourable, predictable and sustainable for our businesses so that they can invest fully. Let me conclude, Chancellor, to recall our support for Ukraine in terms of funding, training, equipment and also weapons. And I welcome the effort made by the European Commission and in particular Commissioner Breton on this during recent weeks. My group will every day continue to push every state to make more of a contribution to ensuring that Ukraine can win this war. Germany has made, taken decisive choices on this. Could you tell us the next steps in what you intend to do to support Ukraine? Europe needs to respect the sacrifice made by Ukrainians and we need to adapt our institutional framework so that we can welcome more European countries. This is crucial. It's an important part of our European DNA. Chancellor, you finished with a quote. I'll do the same. A great social democrat, a French one this time, Jacques Delors. 
who used to say that Europe is like a bicycle. If it stops moving forward, it will fall over. I hope that together we will manage to keep it moving. Thank you. Now to the co-president of the Green Group, Terry Reinske. Thank you, Madam President, Commission representative, colleagues, and Chancellor. You are coming to Strasbourg at a good time because uh, after the last month, uh, uh, there is quite a lot to do. The uh, traffic, light, tra tra traffic Light Coalition talked about uh, renewal and progress. You, party, uh, you. Uh, you said that you were a climate chancellor, somebody who would do it and deliver. To be honest, this present promise, this impressed many for, in Europe. Uh, finally, a chancellor who wants to do something after years of uh, standing still, somebody with uh, an agenda. I have to be honest, Chancellor. You picture a view as a chancellor who delivers in recent years. That has uh, been uh, blown apart and the, uh, the um, demands made by many in this coalition of the role in, um, for Germany and Europe, because the things are just uh, trundling on without having a clear position, and, the, uh, and there are doubts about the role of German government as a reliable partner in Europe, and the ban on uh, the uh, combustion engine was a key part of the uh, Fit for 55 package. What the Chancellor says, he does nothing, and then he uh, hides behind the co coalition parties who, who uh, have wasted the, the tra trust of European partners. To give another example, rightly, Chancellor, you talked about a turning point for Ukraine, but in many places, in Brussels and Stra Strasbourg, and in many capitals of the European Union, it seems that when it comes to every specific step, uh, it goes terribly slow. Um, and we need action, and that's not the way in which a G German Chancellor should position himself. I could continue this list, colleagues, but that's not what we're here for. I'm here, Chancellor, because I'd like to appeal to you I'd like to appeal to you because I'd like to see you fighting for Europe because we need a German Chancellor who thinks uh, and acts uh, Euro in a European way. I'd like to have a China Chancellor who uh, would like to learn from his, uh, the failures of his party uh, when it comes to Russia and doesn't repeat those mistakes with China uh, when it comes to um, human rights and have a clear strategy on China and makes uh, and uh, strengthens our economic and industrial base. I'd like a China chancellor who know who, that this, this continent is only competitive if it sticks together and makes uh, progress in the green transition, even if it costs uh, money. Um, I know who your finance minister is. I would like to see a chancellor who convinces Germans that the stability and growth pact that can make these, um, th is, is limiting these investments which are important for the future. I'd like to s see a Chancellor who says, and you said this yourself, I come from a, 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 a country uh, which hasn't uh, shut itself off, rather it is open to the world. So I'm against an asylum policy which uh, wants to build up a fortress Europe. I don't want to see a Chancellor like that. 73 years ago, Robert Schumann talked about the history of this continent he, when the terror of Nazi Germany brought uh, death and destruction and there were no people in Europe who had, hadn't lost loved ones. He talked about a, uh, a future of um, peace and living together. I would like to see a chancellor who has a similar long-term vision. You want the right things, uh, um, enlargement, the ability to act, the end of unanimity in the European Council. You want a convention, but 
don't uh, be vague. Uh, make progress together with this uh, parliament. Uh, we propose a European Convention. I'm sure if you uh, uh, urge that in the Council, we can get a majority and before and uh, call a European Convention before the European elections. Thank you. So now to the co-president of the ECR group, Mr. Richard Legutko. Uh, Madam President, Mr. Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen. Can you please listen to your colleague? To understand the role of Germany, one needs to start with the basic question. What sort of political system is the European Union? And I submit it is a combination of an oligarchy and a tyranny of the majority. The Parliament functions of, course, functions, of course, as the tyranny of the majority, and the Commission is a typically oligarchic institution, un unelected with limited democratic legitimacy and having an unquestionable lust for power. And as far as I could understand you, uh, Mr. Chancellor, you want this body to have even more power. But the pillars, the pillars of European oligarchy are the big guys among the member states. And the biggest is, of course, Germany. The big guys do what they want, never bother to consult anyone, and call it leadership. And with the voting system in the Council securing their interest, there is little chance they could be outvoted. Of many sins that the German governments have committed, let me mention two. The migration crisis when Germany single-handedly opened the EU borders and recently the energy and security crisis which resulted from its having a long and murky tradition political romance with Russia. Today the German politicians beat their breasts and promise to be good boys in the future. Well, the problem with the big guys is they can promise anything and repentance as easy for them as it is inconsequential. When I hear that the best option would be the gradual abolition of the veto and the abolition of the veto in foreign policy, I simply cannot believe my ears. The Russian policy was the most spectacular disaster of the EU's big guys. And those who are most responsible for this want to have more power in foreign policy. The logic behind it boggles the mind. The more we screw up, the more power we want. The logic would be the reverse, because you screw up so much, you should be kept in check for as long as possible. Chancellor Scholz, I do not have any illusions about Germany mending its ways. You are too big, you are too hubristic. Especially lately I read your statement and I heard something like this today also about Germany taking responsibility for the EU. For the EU, just a matter of interest, if you could satisfy my intellectual curiosity. Thank you. Where can one read about German responsibility for the EU in the treaties? The only proper thing for the German governments would be to take the back benches and, as political hygiene requires, let others run the show. Mr. Legutko, you tried, thank you, very much. you failed, you should withdraw. Unless, Mr. Chancellor, you and your colleagues in the European mm -hmm. oligarchy believe that German leaders, like diamonds, are forever. I give the floor next to Mr. Gunnar Beck on behalf of the ID group. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, sind die Deutschen Are the Germans mad? That is what half the world thinks. And the answer is yes. Germany is suffering from some sort of saviour complex and needs help itself. It is 
endangering financial stability and racking up record debt levels. What about its climate uh, ideas? The Wall Street Journal comes at the daftest policy in the world. Germany can't save the climate alone. It only accounts for some of the world globe carbon emissions. It is just forcing through retrofitting changes to homes and higher costs will be the end result. Germany wants to save migrants too. Five, six, seven million people from the eastern Africa. That's what has arrived on our shores over the last 10 years. Curves about 700 million euro. Africa. Uh, can replace the entire German population every few months, 85 million. Do you want to save them all? And what about your Russia policy? Together with Merkel, you ensured that Germany was reliant on Russia. It was cheap gas. And then the North Stream pipeline was blown up. No real explanation for months. There's been more and more sanctions uh, levied against Russia, costing us a pretty penny. Ukraine cannot win this war, despite all the assistance. Germany and the EU suffers from a saviour complex, but they're not really helping anyone. They are just harming themselves. Psychoanalysis... Uh, Mr Adler said that a saviour complex comes from an inferiority complex. The saviours try to dodge their own problems by focusing on those that are suffering even worse fates. You don't really care whether your help is of benefit or not because you can't then put your inferiority complex into context here. So Germany needs psychological help to come overcome this inferiority complex and to resolve its uh, saviour complex. Unfortunately, your government is not going to pay the price. It'll be our citizens. President of the Lev's group, Martin Schurdewan. Thank you very much, President. Uh, Chancellor, people long for answers because of the growing cases of social instability unfortunately this is not something that you focused on in your speech we see exploding food prices rising rents every fourth child in the european union is growing up in poverty and 45 million people have no idea how they're going to pay their energy bills and then on the other side you have an increase of wealth uh, simply unimaginable levels and because of the um, pandemic uh, we are seeing the number of billionaires explode uh, we are seeing a, a huge profits being made out of war uh, the arms producers uh, the majority of our populations however are not being positively affected by your policies you could have talked today about the obscene excess profits that we're seeing, uh, the ongoing growth of wealth of the super rich. You could have talked about the growth of, um, of or rather the fight against poverty in the European Union. Or you could have talked about a climate policy, unlike uh, your foreign minister, which doesn't allow the ongoing pollution of the environment and the increasing insecurity of those who have less. You, Terry, I'd also remind you, you're part of the government in Germany and the, the, putting yourself forward as an op opposition simply isn't going to play. In 2022, the industries I'm talking about have made record profits and von der Leyen and others have no better idea than simply throwing more money at the arms industry. I'm sure uh, that uh, your predecessors, the ones you've mentioned, Willy Brandt, uh, would have not taken this mistaken path. They would have, or Willy Brandt would have decisively rejected it. They would have promoted peace and disarmament. And this commitment to 
a strategic approach to the European Union is something I would expect from Germany and you. Your finance minister um, has put almost a break on investment with the uh, development of the or rather the rejection of a reform to the, UN de the, the EU debt structure. So we are seeing what I would define as national egotism. Um, it's not sovereignty we should focus on, it's solidarity. We need a solidarity-based pact for investment and the environment. And your government is failing. Uh, it's failing in the area of migration as well. You're making this as a scapegoat for your failures. Your uh, interior minister is uh, coming up with no decent proposals and uh, the attitude, for example, to, to the uh, status of children in the area of asylum and migration is something which is extremely concerning. I think we can declare that you are politically bankrupt, Mr. Schultz. But I would say to you that Europe is the future. It's not a future which is built upon the backs of the poorest, the weakest, and the vulnerable. Europe needs to... Um, look at the, what is happening with the super-rich, and we need to enter an age of social justice. Thank you. Jörg Moythen for one minute. Frau Präsidentin, Herr Bund President, Chancellor, colleagues, precisely you, Mr. Schultz, Chancellor of a country which once enjoyed respect, is presiding over a country in a state of decline and turns up here making an attempt at a visionary statement. This is nothing short of laughable. Germany is under leadership, which is effectively in a vacuum. In the wake of deindustrialization, it is simply a laughingstock amongst many of its neighbours. It is a country which has woeful infrastructure, high levels of criminality, and is in the middle of an education crisis. It has huge problems with provision of pharmaceuticals, childcare, and is languishing in an ever greater social welfare crisis. And here you are propagating your vision for the future here in this House. Helmut Schmidt had a vision for the future, but yours, frankly, would do better to be the subject of a medical prescription. Thank you. I'm shocked, Chancellor, how representatives of political groups talk about you. Um, we've seen a member, Reinke, uh, talk about uh, the disappointment of our neighbours, uh, the geopolitics of our uh, German Chancellor is throwing up uh, difficulties. But I ask you, what policies are you talking about? Uh, last year, you improved delivery of tanks to uh, Ukraine, and the German Greens then come asking for explanations. You said in February that it's necessary to have an effective control of European borders, that almost all of the traffic light parties voted against it. The SPD and Greens uh, voted for sanctions, and then your minister spoke against it. It's clear to everybody in Europe and everybody who's here uh, that in your government, in the traffic light coalition, and in your uh, particular case, there is no ambition for Europe. Rather, there's chaos. We need ambition in Europe. And that's why many people who are in Europe today uh, are looking at Germany and saying that maybe the previous chancellor didn't always deliver, but now the government just isn't delivering. And there was a chance here today, but you didn't deliver with your speech. Thank you. Madam President, members of the Commission, Chancellor, colleagues, let me try to change the 
tone. Welcome to the European Parliament, Chancellor, on behalf of the SPD delegation and the Socialists and Democrats. Mr. Weber, ours is a Chancellor who does very clearly have a vision for Europe, yet he has simply not had an opportunity to come and talk to us about his the differences between his policies and those of Madame Merkel, and yet they are great. As we know, the speech given in Bonn showed us very clearly what inaction and silence on the European continent could mean. But here, Chancellor Schultz is here for a discussion with us and has already flagged up a number of extremely important points, for example, foreign policy, unanimity in the Council, but I'd like to stop for a moment to talk about tax. Many things are important in this context, not least energy. Energy costs for the citizens and energy investment for the citizens in the context of the climate crisis. Russia's brutal attack on Ukraine, China's aggression against Taiwan, the effects of climate change. There are many factors which mean that we're in a politically turbulent time. So it's high time that Europe reviews its position so that future generations can live in peace and prosperity. European sovereignty and resilience cannot be empty words. We need to breathe life into them, innovative ideas and implementation. We need to pursue the acts we have, for example, on raw materials in order to ensure the competitiveness of our continent. But the way towards more European sovereignty is not a sprint. Let's not stop halfway around the track. We need to breathe life into European renovation, more trade, more agreements with democratic partners, no backward-looking protectionism. These are clear words, and we welcome them. We need to bolster our prosperity, un, uh, rather free the middle-sized European enterprises from uh, red tape, more regulation, more prohibitions. We need to remain technologically open. This is the way that we can pursue a climate-neutral Europe. We need research and development, for example, in the area of fusion uh, for CO2-free energy in Europe. We need technological leadership, and we need to be first uh, in some areas again. So we need a strong, responsible Germany in order to facilitate this, which is courageous in the area of shared interests. It, like, for example, the Stability and Growth Pact review. Let's take the challenges and see them as an opportunity. Let's not duck this. Let's make Europe a fit for the future through cooperation and motivation for the needs of our people, because these are our obligation. This is what we're committed to, not political parties or ideologies. One minute. Herr Bundeskanzler, heute ist der Europatag. Wir kennen uns heute und Today is Europe Day, Federal Chancellor, and we stand up here in this hemicycle to congratulate Europe and to wish Europe the best for the future. Many were driven out of your country and out of the European Union and in the past. We have a lot to do to make our European Union more coherent and fit for the future, especially in terms of fundamental rights. We need to speak up loudly and clearly, and we need, for example, to make sure that European projects are properly developed in line with the European treaties, rules and regulations. We need to be aware of what is at stake for the European Union and for its future. We need to stand up for freedom of the press, for example, and we need to sanction any violations thereof absolutely clearly. We need to support aspirations to democratic independence and self-fulfillment. These are all valuable principles of the European Union, which are part of our principles and part of our roadmap for the future. We want to support other countries who aspire to democratic and European values, and we want to stand firm against those who counter them. Thank you. One minute. Ereignisse, die Pandemie. 
Thank you very much. Events such as the pandemic, uh, cost of living crisis, unregulated migration, all of these have prompted us to revisit the role of the EU and Germany. It's clear that citizens look to their national governments in times of crisis. So ref be looking at further transfer of authorities from the national to the European level should be considered carefully and we should not be ashamed of protecting um, the model of Europe as we consider this. Your attitude towards qualified majority in the area of security and foreign policy uh, is something that needs reconsidering. These questions are so important they should not be left to others. I note an increasing anti-German mood in this room and throughout Europe as well. I think a realistic future for Germany is being a strong member of Europe which is a union of member states with equal rights pursuing prosperity and peace for their citizens. Uh, sorry, Harald Wilimski for one minute. Harald. Thank, you, sir. Many Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. About a year before the European elections is a very good time to be drawing up a balance sheet of what we've been doing in recent times. Well, frankly, we've done everything wrong. Everything we could have done, we've done wrongly. And here we are with all kinds of crazy policies being mooted whilst people are suffering from unemployment. Look at the crazy vaccination policy that we had and look at the ill-defined priorities of the European institutions, which are not going to deliver uh, uh, the future that we need. We've been experiencing round after round of sanctions imposed in the context of the Ukraine war, but have they actually done any good? No, because evasion of sanctions simply means that traders rely on India or on China or buy illicitly indirectly from America and ultimately the European Union taxpayers continue to pay the price. This is getting us nowhere. It was ill-conceived from the outset, completely misdesigned. And this is what we've got to correct before the European elections so that finally people realise that they can put people in this house who will deliver a future for Europe rather than this constantly ill-conceived fabrications. Thank you. Grazie, Presidente Mezzola. Thank you, President Mezzola. Uh, President Chancellor Schultz, the Five Star Movement has a very clear idea about the future of Europe, greener, more cohesive and one without war. Now, your country is doing what it needs to at home on these subjects, um, the minimum wage and a trillion euros for renewables. But in Brussels, you have a very different attitude and prevent other member states from making the same progress as you've made in Germany. Uh, if we think about reform of the stability pact, the position of your government, which has been expressed repeatedly by your finance minister, uh, is a return to the past, which takes us back to the dark years of austerity, when GDP percentages mattered more than people's lives. Without new resources, member states will not be able to respect the ob European objectives set in the Green New Deal and for the sustainable transition. Green investments, therefore, will be excluded from a new, a new calculation of the new pact. So finally, a reflection. Here in the um, Parliament, we all talk about the future of Europe, but there can't be a future if there's no peace today. We need diplomatic action at European level to put an end to the war in Ukraine. Peace is built through dialogue, not arms, um, which should not be for paid for with European money. Uh, next is Siegfried Muresan for one and a half minutes. Thank you, Madam President. Welcome to the European Parliament, Herr Bundeskanzler. Wo eine Thank you. Welcome to the European Parliament, where there is a broad pro-European majority looking for solutions for European citizens. In order to find these solutions, we really need to carry out a successful diagnosis. On the 24th of February, with the day of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, left us looking at many changes, not just in Ukraine, but in our European way of living, which has been attacked. European values of freedom, democracy, rule of law. That's why it's so important that as a European Union, we firstly hold together, work together in order to support the Ukrainians. If we'd done that before the invasion, we might have been able to prevent this attack, but we weren't active enough. 
and that is why it's necessary to be swift and strong in responding to Ukraine. Secondly, Russia had planned this attack. It wasn't provoked by Ukraine, despite the claims of Russia. So we need to be very active in fighting Russian propaganda. Thirdly, we need to question our understanding of the world. The approach of not provoking Russia was incorrect. Not offering NATO membership to Ukraine was incorrect. We shouldn't fear Russia, shouldn't fear provoking Russia. We need to ensure that Ukraine is strong because a strong Ukraine is the quickest path to a peaceful Europe. And in closing, given we want a rule-based union, there are two requests, 2% 2 of GDP for defence, as we agreed in every NATO member country, and second, active support for the candidate countries. It's absolutely essential for European citizens and Europe. Thank you. Pedro Marcus for one minute. Muito obrigado, Presidente. Caro Chancellor Scholz. Thank you, President. Chancellor Scholz, welcome to the European Parliament on today, Europe Day. You have had a decisive role in recent times in the path of uh, Europe, uh, particularly um, during uh, the response to COVID. This wasn't done. Uh, uh, only to uh, thanks to EPP, but other parties as well. Now, the street we're following now is uh, more Europe, um, not just broadening, but also deepening Europe. It's thanks to uh, common rules that we've been able to move beyond the COVID crisis. Uh, we need to be um, self-sufficient in um, various areas, but we can only do that if we have more Europe. We need to have permanent um, capacity for investment in Europe. Uh, that's what we need if we really want to see more Europe. Muller for one and a half minutes. Frau Präsidentin, Herr Bundes. President, Chancellor. Yes, shaping a Europe for the future, but you are to a great extent measured by your action at home. And I would say too little too late is the conclusion. Yes, you were correct in identifying the paradigm shift of our times a year ago, and yet Germany is not any better able to defend itself than it was then, arguably less able so, so able to do. Energy supply. Well, you have perhaps managed to reduce your destructive dependence on Russian gas, and yet you have not actually unleashed the wave of renewables you talk about yet you've gone on to ban the generation of energy from sustainable wood. SMEs have always been the backbone of our industry and indeed delivered a great deal of our growth. But instead of openness to technology, to innovation, your government comes to Brussels and simply contributes to creating ever more bureaucratic monsters, complicating uh, supply chains, for example, where there's a myriad of legislation. I'm a milk producer myself, and I would observe that you've actually missed the boat in terms of this paradigm shift. It's left us all behind. In terms of security and supply, of supply, we simply don't have any. We don't have security of food supply in Germany or in Europe, despite understanding how important it is. We therefore need to have the policy which we articulate implemented at long, long last. We don't need more bureaucracy. We don't need any more bans. We need action and we need to deliver. Who is going to be responsible for producing the high quality food that we need once we've managed to destroy the farm sector? Thank you. Herr Bundeskanzler. Chancellor Schultz, your visit here today is a reminder of the damaging effect of the German migration policy. Your coalition government with Merkel and your we can do it policy led to more than a million migrants into Germany and Europe. And unfortunately, 
this policy has been continued under your leadership. It's a policy which is destroying European coherence, the culture, and is challenging the cooperation, the work that can make Europe strong, cooperation between strong and independent states. So as a neighboring country to Europe, we would ask that you stop this damaging and hopeless approach to migration, which has damaged Germany and unfortunately European migration policy. For one minute. Thank you, President, Commissioner, Honorable Chancellor. I just wrote my points you mentioned when speaking about geopolitical Europe. It is integrated European defense, it is new free trade agreements, a larger Europe, institutional changes, management of migration flows, and on the last place, United in Diversity, our slogan. I just want to stay on this and to ask you how do you understand diversity? Whether diversity finishes within the borders of 23 me member states, national, as national states, uh, 27 national states and 23 official languages. I think it is not the way Europe has to go. I want to cite Yegudi Minuhin who told, either Europe will become Europe of cultures or Europe will die. And cultures are much more than 27 and 23 and much more languages. And the politics of uh, linguistic uh, Thank you very genocide much. is taking place in many countries, especially in my country, Latvia, by abolishing education in minority language, but don't even Thank you very much. giving possibility to learn native language. I give the it floor. is not the way Europe has to go. I give the floor next to Mr. Andrei Halitsky for one hour, for one minute, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Szanowna Pani Prezydent. Dear President, uh, dear Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, violent attack on Ukraine was not an accident. That is the result of the weakness and of bad European policies, including the German one. So we should draw lessons and uh, we should learn from that so that we are not weak anymore in the future as Europe. Now, the list of accusations uh, could be long. Now, the first uh, Polish question would be, well, Europe needs, uh, uh, Ukraine needs weapons and uh, money because if Ukraine uh, fights uh, and wins, uh, then uh, it will protect Europe. Where are leopard tankers, uh, tanks? You should uh, deliver on your promises. But I have not heard any German politician today that would not make this long list of accusations because you are not decisive enough. And so I have one very simple request to you. Chancellor. Now, the future of Europe is in our hands. We need to be decisive. Please, if you don't want to make them, at least don't be an obstacle. For one minute. Herzlichen Dank und willkommen, Herr Bundeskanzler. Die Welt ist im Umbruch. Sie haben das. Thank you very much, Chancellor. A paradigm shift defining our times is something which we've got to translate into reality. And the socialists and Democrats have got to ensure that this transition is just. This is something which is both internal. We need to deliver social justice for the member states, each and every one of them, because we have responsibilities to them. But equally, we have global responsibilities. Climate change is a grim reality. We have responsibilities to the outside world as well. And I'm very grateful to those who have spoken including the Chancellor, about the need to work with partners in Africa and Latin America. We want a global trust, just transition. That's what we need to create. That's what we need to implement and deliver. And I'm very grateful that my country is instrumental in doing this. Thank you. Minutes. Mr. Chancellor. 
Half a century ago, your party decided to take a great step by adopting its host politic. As a Hungarian, I clearly remember the results achieved by Germany in Central and Eastern Europe. Times have changed, however, and the once successful policy led to a point where Germany became vulnerable to Putin's Russia. In fact, it led to situations where you were fraternizing with such politicians as Viktor Orban and his lackeys, who had been undermining European values and openly insulting your nation here in this house too. I don't think this was worth it. Just like it's time for Zeit and Weide, a major change in the relations with Russia, it's time for it in terms of Central Europe as well. I understand that German corporate interests are important to you, but modern history teaches us that freedom, democracy and solidarity among European nations are at least as important. Let's stand up together against Putin and his European disciples. Let's work together to help Central Europe help catch up. That's what I'm asking you. One minute. Monsieur le Chancelier, pardonnez-nous franchement. Chancellor, uh, let's be clear, the differences between our countries is sometimes worrying. Uh, France uh, has to take its responsibility, but uh, behind your words, the coalition is putting Europe in uh, danger. You want uh, austerity uh, everywhere. Uh, you have huge um, uh, support for the German economy and um, never mind for all the countries uh, that are left behind. Um, you talk about solidarity, but we're in the middle of an energy crisis and you're closing your uh, last nuclear plants. Here, um, uh, everything is being done to put an end to this, uh, uh, to coal, but um, uh, here, but um, you're polluting with coal from uh, Germany. Um, you've said, uh, Chancellor, that nobody wants to go back to the time when it was the strongest who ruled in Europe. But uh, that seems to be only words. Bundeskanzler, it's high time to revisit these issues. It is finally Gabi Bischoff for one minute. Thank you, President. Thank you. President, Chancellor, as the last speaker, one has the privilege of giving an overview of the discussion today on Europe Day. If you want to perhaps get a clear picture of what we have heard, there's not much in the area of reform and review. We work under pressure. Uh, we need proposals for uh, change to the treaties and we look forward to bringing um, proposals to the Council. Many people have mentioned Schumann today. Europe is created through acts, through specific acts. We are dependent upon uh, initiatives from France, from Germany, and on the basis of those initiatives we can act. Not just on and, and not just talk about the reform of Europe. Thank you very much. Go back to Chancellor Scholz to respond to the questions, the comments, and the very interesting exchange we have had. Chancellor, the floor is yours. Meine sehr geehrte Frau Präsidentin, meine sehr geehrte President, ladies and gentlemen. I very much appreciate having this debate and I appreciate all the contributions. I turn first of all to you, Irace, and say that technology maybe wasn't on our side, but my attempts to learn Spanish certainly enabled me to understand enough of your excellent speech to appreciate it very much, and I pay tribute to you for that. We face many, many challenges, as we all know. We have to modernise, we have to take the European Union forward. This is our task for the future. We need a geopolitical union and I've outlined the principles which will guide us to this destination. A number of points have been raised this morning which I'd like to make a few remarks. Yes, we do need to consider are we for enlargement? Have we decided to enlarge the European Union? If we have, then we need to make the necessary internal reforms so that Europe can continue to function. And this is why, this is the reason why 
I have said what I have in terms of the need for reform. We can only enlarge if we move on from the unanimity rules and we have qualified majority voting on the central issues. We won't be able to do without changes to the treaty in due course, but we do need to agree that it's not a domination of minorities by majorities. It is simply a question of how we are able to act, how we are able to deliver the compromises which we desperately need in order to develop a successful democracy. And this is why I say what I am saying here this morning in terms of tax and foreign policy. We need majority decision-making to make us able to act. And, of course, there are a large number of other questions which we're going to have to discuss in the context of enlargement and otherwise, because there are a number of prospective members in the waiting in the wings, but there are many countries in the European Union which, when we extend our solidarity more widely to countries as yet with the EU, will feel the effects thereof. And therefore, we need to look at the specific steps which we will need to take looking towards the future, and we need to be realistic. We need to have the courage of our convictions and see what we need to do and do it. It is very, very unfortunate that 20 years ago we gave some prospects to the Western Balkan countries of accession to the European Union, and we have effectively taken no steps forward at all. This puts our credibility, our very credibility as the European Union, at stake and calls it into question. Many political families have participated in today's debate and have contributed indeed to the debate over the years and to taking forward the developments towards greater enlargement. Many countries are going to need major constitutional changes, and this is what I hope we will be able to see in the near future. In the context of North Macedonia, I hope the EPP will support us in our endeavours to support the necessary constitutional changes. We are firmly convinced that we've got to support enlargement and accession processes in the right way in each country and be open and supportive to the citizens in all these countries to bring them into the fold. But we need to do this in an orderly way, in a structured process. And the North and the South will only come together if we agree that we are united in our diversity, but that our diversity can in turn become our strength. And I should like to reiterate what I said during my speech, and it is this. As we look towards a future, a world which will have an additional 2 billion citizens, and we will still be half a billion here in this continent. If we don't act together, if we don't stand together, we will become irrelevant and insignificant. We will have no say on the future of the world. And therefore, we need to move away from the dominance which we shaped in past centuries, and we need to work to become a good and fair and committed partner based on unity and commitment to the global community. Many of you have spoken about the appalling atrocities and the war of aggression perpetrated by Russia. This is indeed a threat to peace and security in Europe and indeed to the entire world. Through the Russian attack, as we have seen, we have called into question our understanding of security, our policy of detente pursued by Willy Brandt and Helmut Schmidt down decades. We've seen that there are those who don't believe in borders, who think that the OSCE borders and the other political process which is, have delivered European borders can simply be torn up. Russia has on a number of occasions agreed in the context of these processes on the borders, but has now reverted to an imperialistic vision the, that might is right and that you can simply invade the territory of a neighbouring country should you be so minded. We will never stand by and watch this. We will never allow this. And this is why it is so important that we continue to support Ukraine throughout, right as long as it is necessary, and that Ukraine be able to rely confidently on our support. And I've listened carefully to all the contributions, many, many of them in German, throughout this debate from a number of different corners of the chamber. 
And from this, I have gleaned a number of conclusions. It is very important that we approach these issues in the right way. Germany is the biggest financial supporter of Ukraine. We are committed to continuing on this path because we wish to continue to support Ukraine in its battle to achieve independence again and in its battle for freedom. And Germany is also in the vanguard in terms of supplying weapons. There are those amongst you who have, I think, forgotten exactly what the reality is. Germany has supplied a large number of weapons and will continue to do so. And we have been decisive in the context of discussions with colleagues and others in deciding to send battle tanks, for example. Many people who were active in the debate some time back have simply disappeared from the field. But now we have done this, and this is with the support of the citizens at home and in conjunction with carefully crafted policy, which we shaped in conjunction with our colleagues so that we have a shared responsibility for a responsible, effective policy which serves the interests of Ukraine and the people of Ukraine. That is what Germany stands for. That's what Germany is committed to. Allow me just to pick up on a number of points in energy policy. I don't want to leave any doubt about the position that Germany espouses in the area of energy security and energy policy, uh, not least in terms of as pursued by my government. We are, it is argued, notionally responsible for some 2% of global emissions. What are we doing to counter this? And what are we doing to deal with climate change and reduce emissions. Well, our economic innovation, our industrial innovation, our engineers, our entrepreneurs, our innovators and our technology are making a great contribution to enabling humanity to tackle climate change. This is something which we need to, to say loudly and clearly. The citizens of South America, of Asia, the citizens in Africa are able to aspire to living standards which we have in Europe and we need to ensure that they can attain this because it will only work for us if it works for them and therefore we need to be able to have a universally available technology based on the industrial processes which we are developing and delivering that are globally available and that is exactly what Germany is working to provide. We have committed ourselves that by 2045 we will have a CO2 neutral economy and this means extensive electrification. It means more electricity production as has been said on a number of occasions. It also means hydrogen rather than coal, gas and oil. But between now and 2045 is not even 25 years. We have therefore got to invest and Germany is a country which has is an industrial powerhouse if 600 terawatt hours of energy is consumed, then we've really got to recognise that by the end of the decade, it's going to be at least one third more than that. And by the 2030s, we're going to have to produce even more, considerably more, and an order of magnitude more. And this will have to come from wind power on sea, on land, biomass, and other sources, and we're going to have to have 24-7 available energy, which means we've also got to work on batteries and on storage, and we've got to work on enabling industry to function with hydrogen. And there are many, many other challenges, but we can only address these challenges if we have the courage of our convictions, if we are honest about the magnitude of the challenges, and if we all work together. And that means the Commission, the Parliament, the governments, and that means that we have got to implement the goals that we've set ourselves in all these pieces of legislation and regulations. We have got to up our game here. The technology is there. We need the money. We need the investment. We need to accelerate so that we are investing at the pace that the challenge requires, so that we are up to the challenges. And this means for us half a dozen solar or wind power plants a day. It means thousands and thousands of pipes so that we can transport energy. It means interconnectors. It means offshore 
wind power plants, many, many more than today. Therefore, the Commission, the Parliament and the national governments need to have the courage of their convictions. They need to understand, yes, legislation is necessary to deliver the change that we need. And we can't succeed in everything overnight, but we need to mobilise. We need to mobilise the innovation that we have, the potential we have, and then we will generate economic and economic development and investment, which will be an unparalleled improvement on what we have ever experienced in the past. Allow me to comment briefly on our shared economic and finance policy. I think that we have a good tale to tell here because we have put together the Recovery and Resilience Fund. We have put together finance initiatives, which uh, I was party to when I was Finance Minister of Germany, which have contributed very effectively to supporting the economy in the European Union. We were threatened by a global pandemic, which of course affected each and every country of the European Union. We came together on a basis of solidarity, in a spirit of cooperation, we worked together before the funds were even there, and we put together a framework, an architecture for European cooperation, which was unprecedented. And this is why we knew that we can now rely on this sort of cooperation going forward, and that the German government will play its role to the hilt where solidarity is required on each and every occasion in the future. But I would also say that we stand for stability, and that includes fiscal stability. And that means that we need to work in a rational way together in order to find the right solution. And this is what we have in our coalition treaty in Germany. And this is the logical consequence of long discussions, because we know we don't want to precipitate austerity crisis in any countries. But it does not mean that that anything goes in fiscal terms. We need stability. This is critical. And we therefore need to limit debt. We need to ensure that we can't, that we don't just see disproportionate, unlimited escalations of debt, because that simply exacerbates crises rather than helping to resolve them. And therefore, we need a balance. And that is what drives our position. But with all that in mind, we will have hard negotiations ahead, certainly, but we will, on the basis of solidarity, come up with a solution which is acceptable to and applies well for all. There are those who have mentioned the policy of detente, and I myself have mentioned Helmut Schmidt and Willy Brandt. What I would like to say is this. If you look back at the longer arc of history, then you realise that Willy Brandt and Helmut Schmidt's policy of detente was also at the same time, at one and the same time, a uh, defence policy and it enabled us to invest up to some 4% in our defence. But now we in Germany are saying that 2% of our economic G our GDP is to be invested in order to achieve the NATO goals, then that is something which lies absolutely in the path in the, as a logical corollary of Willy Brandt and Helmut Schmidt's policies. It is a logical step further down that line. Let me say that we must not forget the context in which we are working today. The Russian attack is a threat. It is a huge threat because it is something which is grounded in the might is right approach that might trumps right and law, and we cannot simply pretend that this is not the case. This is a very clear message that's being sent to us, one and all, and therefore here in NATO we have to leave no stone unturned to make quite clear that we are strong enough to stand up against this. We can and we will. We are an alliance of peace. We're a defensive alliance. We will stand up and be counted, and we will ensure that we return to the consensus both in Europe and globally. It's not revisionism, but we will not see changings to borders being enforced by violence and aggression.
and therefore I am delighted to be able to work in partnership with the European Parliament. I am delighted to be able to work towards the future on the basis of courage, conviction. Yes, of course, there are times when lengthy, protracted negotiations are necessary, but results can be achieved. And in a world of pluralism, in a world of liberal democracies, where alliances across member states are so important, it is all the more important that we come together to find a compromise way forward, that we stand together. The way that we stand together doesn't simply mean that the Holy Ghost will appear and that we will all, as a miracle, agree. It means that we will use our inspirations, that we will work together, that we will work with partners, both within national parliaments and here, to achieve these high goals that we've set ourselves. Democratic debate must lead to a result which is good for all of us and, above all, good for the future of the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chancellor Scholz. Thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, we will move now to the votes and allow the Chancellor to leave the room. Thank you.